Like I tried to be woke and have a victim mentality. Yeah. And my father would not allow it. Hey everybody, welcome to Contra Talk. My name is Richard Henry and uh, my special guest today is April Chapman. She is a wife and a mother. She's a follower of Christ. She's a fellow YouTuber, entrepreneur, business owner, and uh, we're going to be talking about a bunch of different things today. Welcome to the show. April, how you doing? Hi, Richard. Thank you so much for having me. This is actually not our first time on camera together. It's we, not. Um, it's we not. did a collaboration, um, was it a month, two months ago? Oh, the ERLC stuff? Yeah. Right, 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 right. And I thoroughly enjoy collaborating with you on that. So when you yeah, reached out and was just like, hey, I want to interview, I was like, let's do it. Let's do yeah. it. So I'm glad well, to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for taking some time. Um, so you're on YouTube. You got the uh, Standard of Truth podcast. Uh, why don't you just kind of flesh out for everybody, uh, those who might not know or just need a little more, just curious about it. Why are you on YouTube? Why do you use the platform? And what overall is the Standard of Truth? podcast. Right. So it's funny that you asked that because I've been unofficially creating content for years. So when I entered the social media space on Facebook, um, I would always put my thoughts just on my Facebook wall because that's just what you did. And then I remember when Facebook introduced the Facebook live option. Um, if there was something kind of going on in the culture or something going on in evangelicalism at large, or just if there were just things going on in my life, whether it was just entrepreneurial things or civic things going on in the community, I would use Facebook Live to just speak to whoever would listen. Mm. And I noticed that um, I had an ability to engage my audience, but just by being myself, I didn't have an agenda. I didn't have like a plan. It was just April hitting the live button and providing my thoughts and commentary on whatever was going on. Nice. And then I noticed that people were on YouTube and they, this thing called content creator. I mean, I just never knew that. I've always had a YouTube channel because you get one with the Gmail account, but I never used the platform for anything official. Um, I had thoughts of starting the Standard of Truth podcast probably like four years ago. I had wrote the name down. I found an old journal of mine. The name has been picked out for years. Cool. But I am a homeschooling mom of four. And mm. at one point I had four, four and under. And it was just impossible. Wow. There was no time Seriously. to do a podcast along with um, working alongside my husband in our business. So... I just was like, okay, well, I'm just going to focus on being a mom, homeschooling my kids. And then once they got a little older, a little bit more independent, um, I started getting invites to other people's platforms just to weigh in on whatever was the theological controversy of the day or mm -hmm. political. Um, I was known for uh, doing <laughs> political commentary because I, I do share a very unique perspective. I am originally from uh, New York City, the Bronx to be specific, um, but I've lived in the South for over 20, uh, I want to say 25 years. And so migrating here, coming from an urban context, my life experience, it crossed several different cross sections of, I guess I would, I would say our social socialization, right? You know, growing up urban girl and then coming to the South and so I had all of these different life experiences. And I just had a lot to say about a variety of different topics. So at the latter part of last year, um, I was just invited to be on a podcast or be on someone else's show. Mm -hmm. And then one day, Dear Well Christian, Jason Whitaker emailed me. It was just like, oh, what's the plan? You know, the future plans for your show. How do you see it growing? And I was like, what show? I was like, I don't. I don't have a show. He was like, what do you plan on doing with your YouTube channel? I was like, what YouTube channel? I was like, oh, the one where I was just putting random videos here and there. Yeah. And it got me to thinking. I was like, well, you know what? The kids are older. I almost have a high schooler now, one middle schooler. And the, the girls are old enough that they're very much more independent than they were when they were tiny. 
Mm -hmm. My husband was like, you know what? This is probably the right time. I think you should go ahead and start it. I support you. This is the format I see. Let's roll with it. And that's how the standard of truth was officially born. So basically on that channel, we discuss theological, cultural, social, educational, political things from a biblical perspective. Nice. Um, and that's just always been my angle. It's good. No, I appreciate that. Um, and so you have, so you've got YouTube. Are you, where, where else are you as far as just, you mentioned Facebook. Uh, are you on Twitter? Do you have Gab? Do you have other, Ooh. other things that you're using or podcasting? Like I know, um, Spotify, iTunes, all that, or Apple Music, whatever it is now. Right. Well, I am, I've never been a Twitter or whatever you call it, a tweeter. I don't like yeah. Twitter. So I am not on Twitter. Um, I am still on Facebook. So the Standard of Truth podcast has a Facebook page. Um, I am on Rumble. I do have a personal Gab account, but I don't post there very much. Mm. Um, Telegram. And then, oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> and then the podcast itself is on Amazon Music, Spotify. It was supposed to be on Apple, but um, it could be just something syncing with my settings. I do a lot of mostly video um, content. And so that content has to be transferred to audio. And then yeah. it's a whole little, it's, it's not impossible, but I also do have the website. So the every episode for the most part is on the Standard Letter Truth podcast website. Okay. And what's that address, April? The Standard of Truth podcast.com. There you go. <laughs> easy enough. Easy enough. I and it. I blog occasionally. Like if this is something really pressing on my heart, like I, I did a blog post about the importance of the local church, yeah. um, think different things like that. So I do plan to blog more over there, but I don't have like a regular content creation schedule for the blog. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. And so would you say then, and we'll get more into it in a moment, a few minutes, mm -hmm. um, the reason why you started, like you said, you were on Facebook and it was kind of in, inadvertent um, content creation. Uh, I kind of call YouTube long form Twitter, right? I mean, in one sense, because you're sitting down and having an argument, especially if you're talking about a political thing or some big Eva thing or, you know, right. this false teacher is wandering around talking about being a little God or something like that. You know, people tweet about that stuff all the time. They they have all sorts of debates, but you can do you can click, click, click. And then that's it. It takes right. 30 seconds. But what was it? Was there something in particular that you saw, you know, cultural? I mean, obviously, you know, Obama was elected in 08 and that was supposed to bring peace and prosperity and unity for everybody and then reelected. And then, you know, then Donald Trump comes along and then politics and then the church and the race wars of 2020. And what what was it? Was there a particular like kind of flashpoint for you that made you say, OK, I really need to get more serious? I know, like you said, Jay, you mentioned Jason. Was there anything else that you wanted to add to that? Well, yeah. Well, I would say that one thing I noticed is that from the theological perspective, there weren't a lot of females in the space that were doctrinally sound. Yeah. Um, like you can probably count them all on one hand, maybe add the other, but yeah. there wasn't um, a huge presence in the YouTube space of, you know, a woman who just loves God and loves theology and then wanted to lend a theological perspective to just everyday issues. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I felt that I was like, this is something I can do, right? I love to communicate my thoughts and I love talking about God and his word. Um, I'm not preaching or anything like that. Um, I'm yeah. fully complementary in, in that sense. But like you said, YouTube is like long form Twitter in video format. And so once the pandemic hit um i did start creating um some health-based content surrounding that issue you know yeah. articulated in detail but um definitely that was probably the driving factor between the pandemic our country's response to it and just how so many people i felt like my voice was being suppressed because i could not just speak openly about the elephant in the room so that was one primary issue that pushed me to say, you know what? What the heck? I'm being censored anyway. I'm gonna <laughs> get um, I'm gonna get my message out. I can house my own content on my own website. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just I just knew that I wanted to 
speak to God's people, Christians in particular, and that doesn't mean there are Christians who don't take in my content, but I knew I wanted to be a voice and have a feminine perspective um, on a myriad of issues, but with the foundation of being scripture alone. Mm -hmm. So whether it's my guests that I invite on um, or the collaborations that I do, um, it's distinctively Christian content, but it's very relatable. People can be like, you know what? I didn't think about that perspective or, well, why didn't I think about that sooner? Or, you know, no one's ever put it like that before. It's not that I'm presenting new or novel information. It's Mm -hmm. just, I just tend to fuse uh, theological positions with my personality and the issues of the day. And it just makes a content cake. That's all like, that's how I would describe it. (laughs) That's good. That's good. Um, you mentioned, I know you've, you've, I forgot about that until you just mentioned it with health. Do you want to flesh any of that out? I I'm a big, I don't want to say health nut, but <laughs> definitely pay much more attention to nutrition, reading labels. What's in this? Yeah. You shouldn't yeah. eat that. I mean, our children, I mean, one example, not to brag, but like our kids can't have soda till they're 12, uh, because it's just, it's just so bad and so addictive. And our, our, our oldest is almost 12 and she's like, eh. And I'm like, yes, right. finally. Because I mean, I, just a minor, minor story about me. I had uh, over 12, I think it was 14 sodas on a 4th of July when I was like 11, 11 oh years old. Oh my goodness. Yeah, because it was free and, you know, it's the neighborhood and whatever. And I remember going to the fireworks later that night. And I'm just like, Whoa. and it's like, of course, you know, I drank like over 100 ounces of high fructose corn syrup and right. artificial whatever. So, you know, not that's not the only reason, but there's a lot of stuff that I think we do as parents and as Christians that we just kind of like, well, you know. Yeah. And we don't really think much about it. Right. So. I'm glad I'm glad you brought that up because technically I had a YouTube channel before the standard of truth um, on the health and wellness side called Basic Healthy Living. And mm-hmm. I started it during the pandemic. So I've been a health coach for over the, about 13 years now. Oh, well, um, but I don't I don't I'm not really taking on one on one clients mm-hmm. like that anymore. Um, but that's always been a passion of mine. And it always concerned me that God's people, I'm like, we're just so sick. And if we just had the right information Mm -hmm. to educate ourselves on how to nourish ourselves and some of the things you talked about, like the food additives and like my, now my kids have never had soda. They have no concept what soda tastes like. The closest they've had to a soda is like a Waterloo or Fresca or uh, what's the other sparkling water that with the different flavors. (laughs) Um, oh yeah, but we we do a lot of sparkling right. water. Although even only right. our little kids even drink it, our older ones don't even drink it either. <laughs> exactly. So I just um, I I was putting out that kind of content, but it's mm-hmm. just it's difficult trying to grow two YouTube channels. Yeah. And um, my health and wellness is always going to be there. That is a skill set and an area that comes natural to me, and mm-hmm. I'm constantly staying abreast on what's going on. I'm big on um, immune health. I am big on prevention. Like you said, you're either going to pay now or you're going to pay later. So it's either Mm -hmm. co-pays, deductibles, and pharmaceuticals on this side. Or it's like, you know what? If I just make some different choices here, it's going to pay dividends on the long end. And this is all while reconciling the fact that we live in a sinful fallen world and death is a byproduct of the fall. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the health challenges many of us experience, a lot of it's just self-inflicted and digging our graves with a knife and a fork. Yeah. So I, I do put out some health and okay. wellness content from time to time, not as much as I would like to, uh, because I, I am still heavily involved in our family business. Mm-hmm. Uh, perhaps once the kids get a little older and, um, you know, who knows yeah. that's just, that's a passion that's never going to die. Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah. Uh, you want to flesh out any, what you all do? You said you mentioned a family business, entrepreneur and all that. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, we're in, we're in the home furnishing industry, so okay. we have a retail establishment, and we also have um, a manufacturing line where we manufacture um, a line of case good or start to use a technical term dining room furniture, occasional furniture. So whether it's farmhouse tables or custom built in closets and things like that, nice. um, we do that. We've been. Ooh, let's see, we've been in the home furnishings industry. We actually, okay, so my retail store celebrates 10 years this month. And wow. then the furniture line, that's my husband's thing. He is an incredibly talented um, designer and artist um, and just 
he is like his own furniture manufacturer. So I'm very wow. proud to support him in that endeavor um, because he is really, really talented. And it's a skill set that not a lot of people still possess. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know. I just think he came out the womb knowing how to do this. Stuff. <laughs> That's great. I, I don't, I'm not a creative person at all. And then my children, they have their own wood sign business. So they have an accessory line that was a spinoff of the furniture line. Um, their accessory line is called Farmhouse Signature Home. And so they do um, wood inspired wall art, home decor and accessories. So like this sign here, that's a farmhouse signature home piece. It is a solid wood sign with the Standard of Truth logo on it. That's cool. I might have to uh, get their contact <laughs> and have a have a sweet little sign made. I've actually well, been, their I've been wanting to do that. Right. So no, I can I can wait. It's fine. I can wait. I'm not no Absolutely. rush. Absolutely. Yeah. That's my baby sign. They did. Love it. No, that's great. Um, all right. Well, I mean, we could probably talk all day about just life and, and all that. It's so good. And I, I think it's an encouragement to always hear that. I hope it is for the listener as well, because, you know, you don't just have to do quote unquote one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, or if, you know, you're just, you people see this guy or gal on YouTube or on Twitter or their pastor or, you know, their favorite author or whatever. And that's, they think that's all they do. And it's like, well, I'm also a dad. I'm also a mom. I'm also, you know, I'm also married. We, I'm doing this. I've, I've got to eat food. I've got to do this. I've got right. to, I like to build stuff. I've got hobbies and so on. And no, so I do a lot. I mean, I, I'm, I'm real active locally. So I'm really civically engaged. Politics was some, it was like a new passion that I picked up probably after the 2016 election. I didn't realize how interested in politics I was until I was like, wait a minute, this, this political stuff is starting to encroach upon my life. I need to pay attention. So I became very civically engaged there. I did some work with Blexic National and um, I held a position as the assistant state director for Blexic Georgia for a time. Um, then I was also a state advisor for Blexic Georgia. That's Candace Owens's organization. Yeah. Um, nice. But time, like you're only one person. Like I can't be a great mom and a great wife and homeschool and help him doing all of these other things. So I am still very civically engaged and I'm really, really into the pro life movement. Um, mm. Our family, we are abolitionists. We believe um, that life mm. begins at conception. And so we um, fully wholeheartedly support uh, the Georgia Right to Life organization here in our state. And we are actively working to educate on all levels about the life issue. Mm. Uh, and particularly because I'm highly melanated, right? There aren't a lot of people who share my ethnic ethnic reflection that talk about this. Yeah. Um, and that was I was going to segue because I'm sure uh, you had mentioned that you saw the video um, where I was in front of. I could tell you a little bit about that. Um, yeah. I've, Warnock Warnock's Church. Yeah. Flesh that out a little right. bit. Who, so who he is and what, what brought that up and all that. That's really good. Right. So uh, Senator Warnock is the uh, one of the state senators that represent the state of Georgia. Um, he happens to to be an ordained pastor and he pastors the historic Ebenezer Baptist church, which is the church where Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King served as pastor up until his death. Mm. And so um, I, I, it's difficult for me to call him Reverend Warnock. So I do refer to him as Senator Warnock, yeah. um, but he has coined himself as being a pro-choice pastor, which for the Bible believing Christian, such a position is wholly incompatible with the scriptures. And so the current, one of the gubernatorial candidates here in our state of Georgia, Catherine Davis, she coins herself as the other black woman that's running for governor. We have Stacey Abrams who's running on the democratic side, Catherine Davis, a lot of people don't know, uh, but she is actually running um, on the Republican side as a black Republican. Mm -hmm. And she tapped me one day and was like, listen, um, she runs the Restoration Project. It's a project that seeks to educate communities of color about the sin of abortion and the genocide that it represents. Mm. And she just asked me, she said, listen, I'm holding a press conference down at Ebenezer and I just need you to speak five, six minutes tops. Um, and she gave me free reign. She was like, I want you to talk about you know, abortion as genocide. And I said, well, I, I could do that. I said, you know, but Miss Catherine, you know, I'm a Christian. And I said, 
for me to do justice to this topic, I am going to have to bring the gospel to bear. Mm -hmm. And she was like, okay, you know, whatever, fine. Just keep it within the window. And um, I did that. So it was a fall day and I just stood flat footed right in front of Ebenezer Baptist Church. Um, It was on a Saturday morning. And so there it's a very uh, touristy area. So there were a lot of tourists out there Mm -hmm. coupled with the other group, a group of people that were scheduled to speak that day. And I just, the Lord placed on my heart um, the night before. I knew what I wanted to say, but I was like, well, you know what? Let me let me articulate this and put it in in writing just so I could have my bearings. And I just did that. And I, I basically told him, you know, I, I affirmed that life begins at conception and we don't believe your profession of faith um, and that he was an enemy to the gospel and he needed to repent for mm. his position on abortion. And so I actually have, I think that video is still on my YouTube page if people, you know, want to check it out and and hear it. I'll link it in the description if I can find yeah. it. Yeah, but that was a very monumental day for me because I was super, super nervous, but I knew um, that I needed to take a stand for righteousness despite the opposition. Yeah. Um, but I, the Lord was gracious to me and I managed to say what needed to be said and then I went home. <laughs> That's great. Amen. So was that, so did the election already happen then? Cause I know Stacey Abrams ran, but that was a few years ago and there was a, a runoff or whatever. Right. And she ended up losing the, the recount and all that, but that was, so is she rerunning, I guess then? Yes. She is the okay. only Democrat on the ticket for this upcoming. Well, tomorrow is election day. Oh, okay. And, um, so yeah, but Senator Warnock had run, uh, the year before and yeah, 2020 he, as Senator, right, yeah. he, he won him and also, and right. so, you know, he was still a freshman Senator at the time. So this, that, that video is not that old. That video is from 2021 actually. Yeah. yeah I saw it in January. I believe it was like the end mm-hmm. of January. Right. Yeah. Oh, it was, it was good. Very encouraging. Again. I mean, if you have the conviction uh, for whatever it is, then then say something, right? And and, and right. do it. And we only live once, and we don't live very long, right? In the scheme of um, eternity, it's so it's something that you know. I, sometimes I'll preach, even pastoring, and I'll preach. And it's like I'm preaching, and I don't think I'll get fired, but I'm preaching to try and get fired because it's like not to be mean or rude, but like hey. this is important. And church, you know, wake up, be encouraged, you know, Amen. be strengthened, and so on. And that even goes to the outside world of, of no, abortion is murder. You, you are right. killing a human being. I don't care if you have a sign that says Jesus loves abortion. That Jesus isn't the real Jesus. You're worshiping Ooh. a demon, right? Right. right. You know, I mean, and so. Anyway. What, what I would say is that I believe, you know, Christians for too long have allowed our voice and our position to be silenced. You know, mm-hmm. the, the opposition, they're very loud and they're very wrong. Um, but we always see Christians throughout scripture standing alone we see them standing alone Mm -hmm. declaring the truth of what god has already spoken and sometimes it didn't always end well right Mm -hmm. but we know that we have an an, a a heavenly hope like our home is in eternity but while we're here we're called to be good shepherds be good stewards of what the message that we have which is the gospel and we're to bring that message to bear on all situations. So whether it was slavery or now we have the modern day genocide of abortion or regardless of what the issue is, our marching orders have never changed. We've mm-hmm. always been called to be that voice. Now, we do endeavor to live peaceful and quiet lives. Right. No one is arguing that we're no, we're just supposed to be just as loud and a brace mm-hmm. group of people. However, um, the Bible defines justice, right? Not not us or what we right. believe justice is, but the Bible defines justice. And so we should be a voice to speak up in those situations, knowing that the sovereign God of the universe has declared all things, the end from the beginning. We're just supposed to be found faithful. Mm-hmm. And if we're found faithful, then he is going to work all things for our good and ultimately for his glory. That's the position that I take on pretty much every political issue, but it does not mean that that position is followed by silence. Mm -hmm. I am not silent. Um, I I, I got, I have a mug called uh, a member, a guy from my church got me this mug for mother's day and it's called 
Facebook jail inmate repeat offender. And I was put, <laughs> I was in Facebook right. jail so much during the election and then after the election. Then they started putting me in jail for old content. I was like, this, I must wow. be doing something right. So yeah, I was, I was constantly being put um, in Facebook jail. So <laughs> that's great. I'm an inmate, definitely. I love it. Yeah, no, I mean, and and that's, I think I think we saw this especially with the last you know, two plus years now, now everything's pretty much back to normal with, you know, Vladimir Putin solving COVID by invading Ukraine and, you know, tongue in cheek. But I mean, there's all sorts of infant formula shortage and blah, blah, blah. There's all these other distractions now. So people really aren't talking about Rona very much, although you still feel so people just acting like it's going on, which is kind oh, of yeah. astounding. In Georgia, uh, I mean, like I'm right outside of Atlanta. When you go into the city of Atlanta, it's, it's like they're still on code orange high alert. You know, people yeah, are still heavily mask and you know uh, I'm i don't i don't get it yeah i mean even here in kentucky as some some here and there we're in a smaller town now i don't really see much at all but right sometimes yeah we go up to louisville it's about an hour and a half away the biggest city and yeah you'll see that similar but yeah uh, but that's just you know, we could talk all day about that but, <laughs> but but ultimately like we we there's so many churches and pastors and that were like, well, yeah, just we just can't. We don't want to use our cultural capital. We don't really want to. I don't know if we should say something now. I mean, because we could. We just, uh, you know, we have these things. And they're like, y'all, okay, it's been a couple months. We we right. see that most of this is not as bad as they said. And okay, right. great. And all right, so fine. Well, if we want to sit a little further apart, or you want to come <clears throat> wear a mask? Okay, whatever. But like, <clears throat> even in California, where we're we're from, we're not there now. But I mean, they were told by the governor to not sing. And it's like, yeah, when are we going to, when are we going to say something? When are you going to stand up and be like, Hey, uh, no. Okay, I was saying go. something like, a week you know, in. Like exactly. if you look back at my Facebook timeline, March 9th was the day when it was just like, ah, like a week later, I was like, Oh no, yeah. I knew, I knew exactly what we were dealing with. And I was mm -hmm. like, are people really, expecting me to shut down my life and i got called all kinds of nails you're just being selfish i was like no it wasn't that now i get it i i can be a little like uh, right i was trying to get god's people to pay attention i was trying to yeah. get god's people to wake up and see that they were being played and then i was trying to enlighten god's people that this our immune system was created for it to thrive if we just give it what it needs Right. Yeah. So I was like, we should we don't need to shut down our churches. I was like, we could just take this, 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 and this, and we'll be fine. I mean, be precautious, you know, now lick on everybody. But for yeah. the most part, I was like, we're gonna be okay. And so luckily, I am so blessed to be a part of a congregation that after about May-ish, they were like, Okay, well, we're gonna be coming back. Yeah, you know, no pressure. You know, now I needed to get back. My sanctification was like on subpar, it was yeah. horrible not gathering with um my church family so we we started gathering very very early on but yes i knew very early on that what we were being told was not what we were being told is because i've always been a part of the underground health freedom movement yeah i already knew i was like oh i knew exactly what we were dealing with what the plan mm -hmm. was trying to silence the opposition you know only the approved you know um, remedies were, were, were going to be allowed to be used. Like, so I started stockpiling, um, you know, and I'm not a pharmaceutical person, but in the case of the, the V, uh, we had certain, uh, pharmaceuticals on hand that we knew worked well. We still mm -hmm. have them in case yeah. it runs through the house again. Mm -hmm. And, and I was just, all I was trying to do was trying to get God's people to see it. But I saw for the first time in my adult life, Christians cripple out, crippled with fear. Where yeah. I don't, it wasn't even fear of the V. It was like, oh, y'all are afraid to die? Yeah. And I was just like, no, if we're going to go out, we're going to go out together. I was like, don't we all have like an assurance? It just, yeah. it, it saddened me. And I get it. Everybody's not at that same point. And I tried to walk alongside other believers to help them understand, like, okay, so what's the worst that can happen? Okay, we we die. Yeah. Right? We die. Right? Okay. I know that sounds cold, but I was just like, but you're a believer. Like, you're, you're justified by faith. Yeah. 
and your grace, like we're good. But it was very, very difficult to get Christians to think along those terms because I do feel so much of the world crept in mm -hmm. um, into Christian culture. Yeah. Yeah. And there's just that comfort. I remember mm -hmm. preaching because the church I'm pastoring now, I've been there since the end of 2020, but before 2020, March 1st is when I started preaching there, just filling the pulpit. And so I preached a few weeks I was thinking it was the first, the eighth, and then the 15th. Mm -hmm. And then for us here, it was like the 13th, that I think Thursday or Friday, you know, all everything's like, blah, you know, everybody's yeah. hair is on fire. And yeah. we're all like, oh. so I preached the 15th. And then I remember talking to one of the other leaders. I was like, well, do you want me to like keep preaching or do you want me to preach from my basement? Because it was an hour and a half drive for me one way. And so okay. I was like, <clears throat> you know, I mean, this let this just guys do this for a few weeks. We ended up going through into, into end of May. But I remember preaching once we came back. Uh, there's a story, Martin Lloyd Jones, who's pastor from last mm -hmm. century in England and all that. And, um, and, and yeah, I, most people know him, uh, although some of the audience might not. But um, he preached a long, long time in London there. And during World War II, he was in London. Of course, there was the Blitzkrieg and the Germans bombing. They never really attacked England, but they would bomb relentlessly. Right. And so, I mean, right there is is exponentially more dangerous and more scary than, you know, these things floating around that may or may not jump on your face, that may or may not actually be alive, that may or may not actually be stopped by a, a mask or two masks. Right. right? Like, it's just like people, we're not new at this. Like, we've been here for a few thousand years doing these things. Life is dangerous sometimes. It is. Deal with it. Pray about it. Trust the Lord and keep living your life. Right. But there's an account and he's preaching. And he'd been there for a few years at this point. And several bombs had gone off and they're going off and blowing up in different places. Yeah. And one went off like a block or two away. And it rumbled the church building, as the, oh, the story no. goes. And he's praying. His, during his preaching and then he prays uh, and then this happens and everybody stands up and they kind of wait and you know rubble even comes down and if, and if i'm getting the story correct a guy comes up and kind of like dusts dusts off the rubble as lloyd jones is praying he doesn't phase at all wow. the people sit back down and he continues his prayer and finishing the service Amen. and i'm like y'all like if war breaks out, ain't no, if, if this is what scared you, I mean, we wouldn't know what to do. We, yeah. I mean, you're, you're literally going to dig a hole and just hide and not do anything. You ain't going to church. You ain't going to do nothing. And it's like, yeah, maybe there's some time. Sure. We wear our seatbelt. Sure. We take our vitamins. Sure. Yeah. We don't, we look both ways when we cross the street, but there's a point of like, ah, uh, but like you're just, ah, uh, you're, you're living in fear and we can, I, I, I definitely, I mean, that's, that struck me too. And early on was kind of like, what are we dealing with here? Like yeah. how scary do we need to be? And, you know, reading the sensational stories and everything else, but it's, it really is, I think just a lack of trusting God and really just is God faithful. Do we believe that we have assurance in the Lord? Do we believe right. that he's going to take care of us through thick and thin or right. death, or we meet him face to face? Like, one of these things is eventually going to happen, <laughs> right? right? We're all eventually going to die. Like, do I want to die, you know, in this explosion? Eh, nobody's going to pick that. But if that happens, right. well, there's assurance in Christ. Praise and God. So, yeah. Right. I, I wonder how, you know, I think here in the West, we're very comfortable and spoiled. And I'm like, yeah. you couldn't have read about in church history, the martyrs and what they've gone through or the persecuted church now, yeah. what they're actually living through. Right. How, you know, they can't even be caught with a Bible. So they're trying to memorize as much scripture as they possibly can. Mm -hmm. And here we are, you know, cowering down in fear because granted, yes, I don't want to minimize. There was a lot of, it was loss of life, but that was due to our, 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 our governing body's negligence. Yeah. Um, they've known there are plenty, there have been um, pharmaceutical solutions mm -hmm. that taken early, no one's dying. Right. It's, but it's, it's, it's like they wanted, they wanted death because we live in the culture of death. And when I tried to tell people that they were like, no, surely that can't be true. If it <laughs> were, it would be on the news. And I'm like, you are too old to be this naive. Oh, man. Surely they, surely they have our best interests at heart. They sell us lottery right. tickets and they right. sell us microwaves and they sell us pharmaceuticals and they tell us smoking's more or less okay. Like, Exactly. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those same people, huh?
That's a lot. Um, <laughs> oh, man. All right. So I'm sure the audience already can figure it out, but you're not woke. Although you're a female and you're highly melanated. <laughs> Why aren't you woke? April, what, have you ever dabbled in that? And what's your what's your testimony? I'm just kind of a summary coming to Christ. Uh, right. And did that ever justice? And I mean, you obviously mentioned Warnock and MLK, and and he's he's no MLK. Although right. MLK had a lot of problems too, right? Let's be right. real here. But you know, why why aren't you <clears throat> what the world says you should be, even as a Christian wife and mother? Right. Well, for one, my story um, growing up in an urban context. We didn't have a lot of money, single mom. You know, I know who, I knew who my dad was, but he wasn't in the home. And I was just blessed and fortunate to be observant very early on. Mm -hmm. And I knew growing up in inner city New York, I knew our education, our educational system was inferior. And I, um, I was on a subway one day and this homeless person decided I'm in middle school, right? This homeless dude kicks me. And now I'm from New York. So we're used to stuff like that happening. But I think I was just more shooken up because I was like, wait a minute. What? He was just like, Ugh. he just kicked me like on the train for no reason. Wow. And no one came to my defense. You know, I'm a 12 year old seventh grader on the sixth train trying to get to 110th Street in Spanish Harlem. And he kicked me again. And nobody did anything. And I was just like, OK, well, I guess this is how it's going. So then as soon as I. I think 110th Street was coming up. I got off the train and run to school because it's like a two blocks, two avenues over. I get to school. I tell my principal what happened. And he was like, okay, you can go call your mom. I called my mom. She was like, oh, okay, but you're alive, right? I was like, yeah, but like this happened to me. And she was just like, girl, you'll be fine. Yeah. I say, tell that story because at that moment I knew, I was like, okay, I have choices in this life. I said, I knew very early on that I was going to get the heck out of New York City. So that was one mm -hmm. <laughs> purpose of that story, right? I'm get, I'm going somewhere. Yeah. I knew at that point, I talked, I remember I talked to my math teacher at the time who happened to be like the high school counselor to counsel you in junior high. Like in New York City, you have the option to either go to a specialized high school where you have to take a test to get in or you just go to your zone high school and hope for the best. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want either of those options. And I just inquired. I said, well, what else is there? And she was like, well, you know, based on your academic performance, we could test you. You could take the SSAT, which is the secondary school aptitude test. It's like the entrance exam that you take to get into like these prestigious private schools that poor people can't afford. Mm. She was like, I'll help you. And then she turned me on to this organization called The Better Chance, which would help minority students gain not necessarily gain access, but expose you to this other world mm -hmm. of high-end education as a minority, but you, you still had to compete. Okay. So she was like, I'll, I'll, I'll coach you, help you get, you know, score well on the test. I'll do all of your recommendations. She was like, you know, here's this, she gave me this yellow sheet of paper. She was like, just pick some schools. We'll apply. ABC will cover your applications fees. And then we'll just go from there. I was like, okay. So I did that, took the test, scored really, really well, and got accepted to um, a college preparatory high school in Richmond, Virginia. It was a boarding school. Oh, wow. So I went to boarding school for high school. Wow. And going to boarding school was a wake-up call for me. Here I am. All I know are Black people and Hispanics. The only white people I had ever been exposed to were a few teachers here and there in elementary school and middle school, and that was it. So I'm transplanted into this environment where I am only one of three black girls and it was culture shock. Mm -hmm. And then I didn't realize, I was like, oh my gosh, I am not academically prepared. These girls were reading the Odyssey in like the fifth grade. Mm. Wow. And here I am. I'm just like, the who? <laughs> what is, what, are, what? I didn't know anything about this Greek mythology. So I'm learning all these things and I'm struggling just to keep up. And I will never forget, I took, it was my 10th grade modern European history class. We're studying modern European history. And I got a D. Mm. And I called my father, who, like I said, I knew him. He wasn't really active in my life, but I'm thinking I could call him and get some sympathy. Yeah. My father said, I'll tell him, and he, he was like, you know, you, you got a D. 
in this class. And I was like, yeah, you know, you learn about all this white people stuff. Like, I don't, I don't like, and he was like, let me explain something to you. He was like, I don't care whose history it is. You are to compete and you are to do well. Mm. And I was like, yeah, but this is really hard and you don't understand. Like I tried to be woke and have a victim mentality. Yeah. And my father would not allow it. And I remember I got so angry with him because he didn't <laughs> sympathize with the fact that, well, I got here, I got in, but I'm behind and they should give me, you know, like a special test because I can't keep up. And he was mm. like, uh uh, no, 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 no. He was, and at this point, he's claiming me, no child of mine is going to sit here and tell me that they can't pass a 10th grade modern year. It wasn't even AP, his mm -hmm. was just regular modern european history and he was just like no i don't ever want to hear you give an excuse like this again this is unacceptable you need to go to that teacher and see what you need to do to try to bring this grade up mm -hmm. at that moment victimhood went out the window for me and just from that point on i, I just didn't see myself as a victim because i was like wait a minute if I had just tried a little harder and studied, I would have done better. But because I didn't like whose history it was, because I came with these, you know, ethnic biases, I was just like, this is not for me. Mm. And um, that was very offensive to my father. And uh, my mother struggled to keep me in that school until I could graduate. I was on scholarship, but there were still expenses that needed to be covered. Uh, and I worked. So at 15, I had my, I got my first job. And then I graduate, move to Atlanta, go to college. And I just, I've never felt like I was a victim. I, I, my, my father's side of the family are immigrants. They migrated here from the Dominican Republic and St. Thomas. <clears throat> and my grandmother went to college after her children were adults. She was like 55 and became wow. a nurse. Who becomes a nurse at 55? <laughs> Nobody and, anymore, sadly. Right. Yeah. My grandmother did that and she worked till she was like in her 70s. But wow. the point was she demonstrated to us that, okay, I'm an, I'm an immigrant in this country. Nothing is handed to you if you just work hard and apply yourself, even in the face of opposition. She came here in the 20s. Mm. Even in the face of that opposition during real racism, she managed to become a registered nurse in her 50. And then I just, wow. I just come from a long line of we, we just victimhood is just not our thing. Mm -hmm. I, I, and this is before I was a Christian, right? Before I was a Christian, my worldview had already been shaped to be like, well, no, no one's oppressing me. You know, this happened because I made this decision. So mm -hmm. I've always been big on personal responsibility and then becoming an entrepreneur. Absolutely. There was no way I could be woke because the home furnishings industry, for lack of a better term, I'm just going to say it, it tends to be a good old boy industry. There are not a lot of minorities in this space and it's not, it's a generational business. Like mm -hmm. your great grandfather had a furniture store and then pass it on to your dad and you're like third generation. When I go to high point market, I am, I am amongst second and third and fourth generation business owners. Wow. Well, I didn't have that story. So I had to learn this industry from scratch, like from the bottom up. We were a startup, no money. No one gave us anything. We literally wow. worked by the sweat of our brow and just good old American ingenuity. And I just looked at my ancestors, the Booker T. Washingtons, the Frederick Douglass is the ones who were actual slaves who were mm -hmm. emancipated and who had to deal with so much adversity. To me, it's offensive for me to remotely think or consider myself as a victim in light of that kind of heritage and then mm. add my, 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 my spiritual heritage on top of that. Oh no, no, there's no <laughs> here. I know, I know who my, my identity in Christ is. Right. And so it just flows from that. And then being a citizen of heaven and a citizen of America, I've just managed to take advantage of what that means. America is a ladder. You can start from way down there and just you can reach the rung that you want to be on. But it doesn't it, no one hands it to you. 
You have to go after right. it, seek it, and 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 take it for the most part. No, not take by theft, meaning apprehend the opportunity. There's just too much opportunity in America um, for a for for any American of any ethnicity to to claim victimhood. So that's that's one reason why I'm not woke, and then the other is because Scripture just demands me to be alive in Christ. I can't be woke. It's the antithesis of what the Bible teaches. Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah. No, that's good. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, well, yeah. What, so what do you say then to the person who says, yeah, April, but right. there's a lot, there's a lot of oppression. There's a lot. The, the system is against us. The mm. system is, I mean, just, just clearly look at these people. Look, look at how much the white man has done and how little mm. we have done. And just don't, don't you at least want, some sort of like reparation or some sort of just something that's kind of maybe not reparations. Okay. But like, you know, some sort of even playing field. Come on, April. I mean, like right. let's, let's do a little something. What do you say to those, those people? First of all, you know, there's no reason for us to deny America's troubled history or the SBC's sinful history or America's mm -hmm. sinful history. Right. Gotcha. If you're a believer, you should understand two things. One, that God is sovereign, right? And two, that we live in a fallen, sinful world. So mm -hmm. we shouldn't be surprised when people do man stealing, literally ripping people from their native land, being sold by their own people, put on a ship, brought here, and stolen and, and forced into horrific um, conditions for the benefit of others. I get that. I'm very much aware of our history. For me, though, because I'm a Christian, because I wholly rest in the sovereignty of God, I recognize that God was not absent during that situation, nor is he absent now. Are there legitimate injustices that happen in 2022? Absolutely. We, we're still here in this fallen world, right? We haven't been sanctified. So those things are still happening. But I would argue against when they say the, the, the system. Well, let's talk about the system. Let's Which system is it that mm -hmm. we are specifically talking about? Is it the educational system? Okay, great. You have a choice. You don't have to send your child to the government school. You mm -hmm. can do what my family did and downsized our life. We didn't choose to live like the world, keeping up with the world. We, choose, we chose to invest in the fact that I needed to be home. Right. We we looked at our family What gifts, talents and abilities. Robert, my husband, what do you have that you can use to generate sustainable income to support your family while your while your wife endeavors to home educate your children so that they don't have to be put into the system that is systemically racist by some people's opinions. You could do that. Right. Mm -hmm. The thing is, you can't have your cake and eat it, too. You can't. One, covet, you can't covet and just want what someone else has. As a believer, the Bible teaches against covetousness. So if you see that somebody else over there has something, you, you, don't, you don't think I see the Nigerians who come to America and who are the most affluent minority group in this country, followed by the Asians and wonder, well, what am I doing wrong? Why can't they? <laughs> They're coming over here with a suitcase and a coat on their back and that's it. And they're able to figure it out. Yeah. So that says to me, <laughs> whatever these systems are, unplug from the system and create your own way. Find a way or create your own, but don't allow victimhood cells. I get it. When you're in victim, oh, woe well, is me. Like I'm just so like victimized. And, uh, <laughs> it sells. But if you actually want to accomplish something in this life, and if you want to actually live a life that's pleasing unto the Lord and that honors him, you can't be a victim. You, you just cannot. If that's the case, I mean, look at the children of Israel. They were enslaved. We're, I, the, the, the black American experience is unique in the sense of how severe it was. But it's not unique in the sense that we're the only ones who've ever been oppressed. Mm -hmm. The issue is. As believers, you can't always have the focus on you. Like, don't be a narcissist. Look in the scriptures to see 
how we get our cues and our marching orders from the scriptures. One, Acts already lays out how the world and all the people groups and where they were established, that, that, that was a God thing. God's sovereignty established that. So if you're mad that your forefathers got brought here on a ship and was a slave, I mean, you, you could stay there and wallow mm -hmm. in that, or you could say, praise God that my family lineage, I was brought here on a ship against my own will, not I, but my, my ancestors were. And if it wasn't for that, I may not have heard the gospel. I might be worshiping a tree right now mm. or my ancestors, but I'm not. I'm worshiping the one true and living God. And there are some of our ancestors who don't have that story. It's, it's, it's literally the doctrine of election playing out and you can't, you can't minimize or overshadow that. Now, mm. here's what I'm not saying. I am not saying that we are not to have thoughts or strong feelings or opinions when legitimate injustice takes place. I think the abortion issue is a legitimate injustice that we should be screaming from the rooftops, but we're not. We're, we are beyond the, the rate of replacement in the, the Black American community. I don't see the Wakandans championing that cause, shedding light on it at all. The fact that we may not be here as a people group if the rate of baby murder continues. So, and I'm not trying to say, well, you know, racism is here and abortion is here, but we can't even, we, we wouldn't even be able to experience um, partiality if we're not even alive, mm. wow. right? Yeah. We're beyond the rate of replacement. So I would tell those, you know, <laughs> the systems and, you know, you're just trying to oversimplify it. No, I'm not, right? I just believe what the Bible says and my heart has been changed. Something happened to me when the Lord arrested my heart, showed me my sin and showed me you're no better than the slave master, right? Your sin, his sin, you're all depraved. It all flows from the wickedness in our heart. Mm. But God was gracious to me. And if we're all honest, if we really want to talk about privilege, biblically, the only ethnic people group that really mattered apart from Christ, we're the Jews. We're grafted in, mm -hmm. right? We're a wild branch. So I'm like, you want to be upset? I mean, the Jews would really want to be like, well, we were his chosen people. Yes, they were. Mm -hmm. But the gospel and the cross abolished all of that and took people from every tribe, tongue, nation, grafted us wild branches in into the family of God. And now we're adopted sons and daughters. If you can't celebrate in that, I'm sorry, your focus is in the wrong place. And I would argue that you need to be born from above. I don't, mm. I'm not, I don't play with the Wakandans. I'm not playing that game with them because it's not working. Yeah. The victimhood, you just sound like a whiny baby on Twitter. Now you can't lose weight because of the white man. You can't, your hair can't grow because of the white, like get, Get a grip. Yeah. Get a grip. And I would argue for people to, especially my white brethren, don't allow them to put a yoke of bondage around your neck with this white guilt. It is unnecessary. You are free in Jesus. Mm -hmm. So whether it's, you know, the CRT woke issue or any other issue, do not put on yourself that yoke of bondage again. We are free in Christ. You walk in that freedom. And you just give those people the gospel because that that's that's the only answer that I have for them. I mean, that's excellent points, because once you really zoom out just a little bit more and you don't focus on just the only this people group in this particular time. I mean, I've said before, and many people have as well, like everybody's been oppressed at some point. Some everybody's, point. you know, the Slavs, right? The word slave comes from Slavic, for goodness sakes. Right. So it's not. They were oppressed. I'm sure I have ancestors that were oppressed by the Roman right. Empire in Germanic tribes and up in, you know, in, in uh, Britannia in England, mm -hmm. and, you know, seven, eight hundred, nine hundred years ago. And like, how far do we go back? Right. And, that, and that's the trouble that I've always had with like, so but what exactly are we supposed to do here then? Like, OK, fine, we'll give you we'll grant you just for sake of argument, all these things and the system. Then what? But then what am I supposed to do? Like, I'm just supposed to give like 1% of my income to somebody who doesn't look like me because of oppression, right. 2%. I'm supposed to like 
give my truck away? Like, what am I supposed to do? You know, like he's always going to end up with the short end of the stick. And this is why yeah. I can't wallow in that one. I can't constantly look to see what, what my neighbor has and then covet. Cause now I'm sinning. Right. I can't have that hatred in my heart toward my brother who doesn't look like me because of what he has. Now I'm sinning some more. I'm yeah. like, we're just reaping condemnation. There's freedom over here. There's joy. Right. I celebrate, you know, the success of somebody else because I have what I'm supposed to have. Right. And God has also gifted me with skills, talents and abilities that if I feel I don't have enough. Right. Granted, my 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 focus and my vision is heavenward. Like I just mm -hmm. I try to live with a level of contentment because more doesn't mean happier. It just means more stuff that you have to govern and manage. Right. Yeah. Um, oh, that's that's yeah. so against the American dream. <laughs> it is right but i wouldn't choose uh, listen i'm grateful to be here in america yeah. i'm glad that god chose me you know yeah. however i got here i don't know um but i'm glad that i'm here yeah. and i'm just endeavoring to take advantage of the opportunities that are here and when if somebody wants to put discrimination in my way like i i eat racism for breakfast i'm like oh okay whatever i'm i'm just i'm moving forward it's yeah. it has never stopped me in the past um and if it's legitimate injustice that i'm experiencing you know i will trust god with the results you know if there's yeah. the, a legal route that i can take i will do that um but if we believe that the lot when we cast lot if the answer to the lot is dependent on the lord then so is everything else now unless you're just suffering because your own sin then there's that's different right. but you know we have to have a healthy relationship with suffering, not sinful suffering, but suffering for righteousness sake. Mm -hmm. And I just find those that are woke, um, their heart posture toward others and this injustice, it's just, it's, it's just aimed in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. And outside of the gospel, I know it sounds, you know, real reductionist to say, just preach the gospel, but I'm doing a scripture memory challenge on my channel and today's verse was Romans 1 16 for I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek like mm. I don't know what else you Man. want from me I don't yeah. have any other man-made solutions because they're going to be deficient I outside of I just want to exhort all believers to get busy working for the kingdom meaning amen we go into all the world and we make disciples. Each of us encounter people every single day that we walk past and we don't speak to, the lady at the checkout, the lady at the family dollar, or the guy working on our vehicle. Like, just ask the Lord for more opportunities mm -hmm. for you to give the gospel to someone mm -hmm. um, because that's what we're supposed to do. And then anything else, all this whining and griping and complaining. Like it doesn't yield anything, any positive benefits. So why are you doing it? Mm -hmm. Other than the fact that it's probably profitable for you, which is problematic. So my only words yeah. for your audience, <laughs> regardless of what end of the ethnic spectrum you fall on, make much of Christ. That's it. Life is short. Make much of Christ. All of these, the existential realities of our skin color and our, our, our gender, it's just like, it's a waste of time mm. and it's miserable down there. I've never met a joyful, happy Wakandan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's very true. Yeah. I mean, there's always, there's always uh, something else that can be done and some other injustice and some other thing. And, and right. ultimately, ultimately, like you said earlier, it really is. It's just based on envy and yeah. just, I mean, there's always going to be somebody smarter, more attractive, more wealthy, Faster faster better younger older i mean on and on and on right and and until you like you said with acts uh, 17 in particular you know he's a lot of the nations and marked out and this and that um until we fully embrace that and 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 believe it afresh because we probably believe it but it's kind of like ah, how does it apply i don't know uh go check out april's channel if you've not already the standard of truth podcast on youtube that's also dot right. com for the website uh, you are on Facebook if you're not in Facebook jail. So that's good. I'm Don't not find right her on, on Twitter. So <laughs> here, waste your time there. But I'm right. going to put our, her uh, things in the description for everybody. Well, very good. I appreciate the time, April. Thank you so much. You're awesome. See God you. Bless. Bye bye.